Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're talking about chapter 6, section 5, Winning the War in the South. And this lesson coincides with pages 191 to 195 in your textbook. Now, our central question for today is, how did the Continental Army finally defeat Great Britain even though Great Britain had vastly superior armed forces? So, our clue from the day from today is uh, from our essential question is that yes the Continental Army is going to win the war but we're gonna look at how they did that uh, despite the fact that they were outnumbered outgunned and pretty much out everything else in the war and our key terms for today are Battle of Calpins guerrilla not like the animal guerrilla like this is the, the type of warfare siege the Battle of Yorktown the Treaty of Paris and finally, our last word will be ratify. So, I want us to first look at this most awesome of pictures. Uh, um, so, the first time, um, the first time I saw this picture, the reason I put it in this lesson is uh, because the first time I, I saw it, like I honestly laughed so hard that coffee almost came out of my nose. Um, now the picture itself is silly. You got a ninja cat kicking, uh, kicking a dog in the face. But the quote underneath, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog, from uh, Mark Twain. Um, it's, that quote especially is very applicable to today's lesson. Um, we already know, we've, we've talked uh, at length about the British Army and how powerful and how well trained that they were uh, and that they were one of the best in the world um, as well as their Navy. Their Navy was um, one of the, t the biggest and most powerful navies in the entire world at that point. Um, so if there's, they have such military power, uh, how did this loose grouping of soldiers uh, and farmers end up defeating them? Um, so we're gonna, I want you to keep this, keep this picture and this quote in mind as we uh, go through today's lesson and look at how their plan for the southern campaign um, would eventually lead to the defeat of the British army. In Britain, there were growing doubts about the conduct of the war. Costly battles like Guildford Courthouse were reinforcing the view that the war was unwinnable, particularly amongst the Whig opposition to the government. Charles James Fox, leader of the opposition in Parliament, declared, one more victory like this will cost us the whole war. The majority of Britons represented in Parliament had supported the war when it started, five years before. But now, that support was steadily waning. The same voters were paying for thousands of troops in North America, and the cost was too great. And there was always a feeling, especially amongst the Whigs, that the rebels were actually fighting for the traditional rights and liberties of Englishmen. The British had no clear strategy as to how to finish the war apart from more of the same. Preoccupied with worldwide concerns, they were bereft of new ideas. And significantly, the British didn't understand the American strategy personified by Nathaniel Green. We fight, we get beat, rise and fight again. We never have to win a battle to win the war. The side that ultimately gets support of the people will prevail. One of the greatest American generals, Green never won a battle, but he kept his army in the field. Again, the Vietnam analogy is a very strong one. The British are good at winning battles, but can't ultimately win the war. And at the very end of the Vietnam War, a North Vietnamese colonel was talking to an American colonel. And the American colonel said, you never beat us in a single battle. And the Vietnamese said, well, I fail to understand the relevance of that. Um, we may not have beaten you in battles, but actually we've won the war, because the war 
wasn't about individual battles. It was about something longer and broader and deeper. The British position was further undermined when the Commander-in-Chief in New York, General Sir Henry Clinton, ordered Cornwallis to retreat to the garrison town of Charleston in South Carolina. Cornwallis refused. It was a fundamental split between the two very different generals, the Cavalier Cornwallis and the more cautious Clinton. Clinton believed that the war wouldn't now be won by offensive action. He thought that the Americans would eventually get tired of fighting and sue for peace on terms that suited the British. Cornwallis couldn't disguise his frustration with Clinton's defensive attitude. I can assure you I am quite tired of marching about the countryside in quest of adventure. If we mean an offensive war in America, then we must abandon New York and bring the bulk of our forces into Virginia. We should then have a stake to fight for, and a successful battle may give us America. If, however, we plan defensively, then let us abandon the Carolinas and fall back to New York and our salt pork, sending out the occasional raiding party to burn tobacco, etc. So, as I, as I stated, we're going to be looking at, uh, specifically, at fighting in the South. Now, the South became the main battleground for the war after the British plans to conquer New England and New York failed. Uh, if you remember, um, the big plan was to capture Albany, and that way it would stop the flow of supplies and soldiers down to, through, through the South. But we saw that that, that plan failed. So after after the, the, these plans to finish off New England and finish off New York failed, uh, the British turned their attention on the South. Um, now they knew that there was still a very large number of loyalists in the South, and they hoped that if they marched uh, marched through the South, then these loyalists would see them, and uh, all of their pride for New for England would swell up, and they would join up. Um, so. I cannot stress this enough. The British knew that there was still a large number of loyalists in the South, and they hoped these loyalists would join their ranks. Uh, and their entire uh, their entire strategy was winning was based on that assumption that the loyalists would join up with them and join their join their ranks. Everything hinged on on that part of the plan. If I were called upon to draw a picture of the times and of men, I should say that idleness, dissipation, extravagance seems to have laid hold of most of them. An insatiable thirst for riches seems to have got the better of every order of men. George Washington. There sets in a period, a whole, a whole era of the revolution, in which it seems as though there is not going to be a future. The American people are suffering cruelly from uh, want and from despair, and they are weary of this war. This is a situation in which many people are saying, how could we have been so foolish as ever to have believed that we could have taken on and licked the most powerful empire in the world? America's war weariness was mirrored in England. The ordinary Englishman had never been for the war in the first place. To make matters worse, the war was doubling Britain's debts and wrecking her economy. To end the war, the King's ministers put forward a promising new plan, taking the American South. Savannah, Georgia had already fallen to the British the year before. American loyalists assured the Crown that unlike troubles of New England, the South was teeming with subjects ready to take up arms for the King. 
The British government believed that the American Revolution was the work of a small group of malcontents, largely located in New England, and that on the whole the American populace was loyal to the Crown. But the Crown had failed to defeat the Revolution in New England and the Middle Colonies. Now victory depended on taking the South. In New York, British General Henry Clinton recognized the magnitude of his mission. I felt the tottering ground on which I stood. This is the most important hour Britain ever knew. If we lose, we shall never see such another. Clinton sailed with a hundred ships and 8,500 men. His objective was the largest and wealthiest city south of Philadelphia, the jewel of the South, Charleston. Perched on a peninsula, Charleston easily could be cut off. Against Clinton's impressive force, the American general, Benjamin Lincoln, had only half as many men. The British began digging in for a siege. After 19 days, trapped by the Royal Army and blockaded by the Royal Navy, Lincoln called a council of war to discuss a withdrawal. The city fathers were vehemently opposed. Some declared to General Lincoln that if he attempted to withdraw the troops, they would cut up his boats and open the gates to the enemies. This put a stop to all thoughts of an evacuation. General William Moultrie. On May 9th, a furious cannonade would erupt between the two armies. Mortar shells crossed and exploded long into the night. General Moultrie observed it appeared as if the stars were falling to the earth. Three days later, surrounded and cut off from help, Lincoln finally surrendered. Charleston was the worst rebel defeat of the revolution. 5,466 Americans, including General Lincoln, became prisoners of war. It was America's largest surrender to a foreign army until the fall of Bataan in World War II. The soldiers captured at Charleston were crowded into prison ships and other loathsome quarters. Nearly one-third died. Their hardships were not alleviated by civilities from their conquerors. Dr. David Ramsey. Get back here! During the revolution, 18,000 Americans were taken prisoner. Almost half died. In the end, more patriots died in British prisons than on American battlefields. By 1780, the Americans had taken more than 9,000 prisoners, but they lacked the experience, the jails, and the manpower to hold them. Many simply wandered away. The rebels' treatment of loyalists was a different matter. In Kingston, New York, loyalist prisoners were entombed, in essence, in a subterranean cellar underneath the building where the Provincial Congress of New York met. It was so overcrowded and it was so filthy that in the smell rose through the floors and permeated the meeting room in which the Provincial Congress was meeting. The stench was so terrible that a resolution was passed permitting congressmen to smoke, as the resolution read, for the preservation of their health.
After capturing Charleston, General Henry Clinton returned to his headquarters in New York. His second in command, Charles Lord Cornwallis, remained behind to roll up the rest of the South. In May of 1780, he was on the move in South Carolina when he learned that a small rebel force was 10 days' march away. Encumbered by his army, Cornwallis knew he could never catch up to the rebels. So he sent an ambitious 27-year-old lieutenant colonel in pursuit. Bannister Tarleton, who was this young buck. You know, he's one of these kind of flashy Errol Flynn characters you always get in, in warfare. And he was only good up to a, a certain point because he was so hot-blooded he got himself into trouble. Tarleton and his men covered 105 miles in 54 hours. On May 29th, they caught Colonel Abraham Buford's column of 300 Virginians on flat ground with no cover. Tarleton, his infantry and cavalry advanced to the charge with the horrid yells of infuriated demons. Buford ordered a flag to be hoisted, expecting the treatment sanctioned by civilized warfare. This was no part of Tarleton's creed. Dr. Robert Brownfield. When an American raised a white flag, Tarleton personally cut him down. In the end, not one rebel was left standing. For Tarleton's deeds that day, the red-haired firebrand became a British hero. But in America, his name became synonymous with barbarity. The term Tarleton's Quarter came to mean, take no prisoners. To replace the men lost at Charleston, a new American army was marching south with a new commander, General Horatio Gates. Washington opposed the choice. Gates was more an administrator than a fighter. Congress hailed Gates as the victor of Saratoga and gave him the command. For his first southern offensive, Gates targeted Camden, South Carolina. Held, he was told, by only 700 men. Against all advice, he ordered the march by the shortest route straight through barren country. When Lord Cornwallis heard of Gates' approach, he marched his army north to confront the rebels. On August 15th, the two armies collided in the night. The next morning, before the fighting resumed, Gates deployed the unseasoned militia on his left and center, and on the right, the veteran Delaware and Maryland Brigade, under the Bavarian volunteer Johann de Kalb. But Gates didn't send in de Kalb's veterans. Instead, he dispatched the inexperienced militia. The British seized the moment. Within minutes, 2,500 men, four-fifths of the American army, ran away. Only one militia regiment, and de Kalb's Maryland and Delaware veterans, stayed on the field. So de Kalb leads his division from the front. It's a follow-me type of leadership. I'll ask you to do nothing I'm not prepared to do first myself. He stands and fights, and he refuses to surrender. Wounded multiple times, and then he's bayoneted to death. When the militiamen ran from the field, General Gates rode past them, all the way out of the state, and kept on going. 
he never fought another battle. Now, at first, uh, the British won a number of very early victories in Georgia and South Carolina. They marched in and were easily able to win some battles, but the tide turned by late 1780 when uh, some of the Patriot forces started to win victories in the South. Um, now, these battles were primarily between Patriot and Loyalists, so you've got um, family members fighting against, you, against each other, brother against brother. Um, Patriots and Loyals, they attacked each other, burned houses and fields, some even killed civilians. Um, the Patriots would attack the Loyalists, the Loyalists would in turn attack the Patriots and any Patriot sympathizers. And um, by 1780, uh, some of these violent attacks by British and Loyalist forces actually backfired and caused many uh, of the former Loyalist sympathizers to side with the Patriots. Um, so, and the lesson to be learned here is that if you fight dirty enough, uh, eventually people are going to take notice and eventually will feel like, you know, enough is enough, something needs to stop. Um, and um, so this happened especially in the South um, where you have Patriot and Loyalist forces fighting each other, but then it got to a point where the attacks were so vicious that many people pulled away from the Loyalists and, and joined up with the Patriots. Now, uh, Nathaniel Green and Daniel Morgan, these are two uh, generals for the uh, colonial army, used very clever tactics to wear down the British army at the Battle of Calpins and Guilford Courthouse. Um, now, Green, it was said that he was almost as clever a general as Washington. And so he was given control of the Continental Army in the South. Now, he didn't have as many men as the British Army, but what he did have was a very good working knowledge of the local geography, and he used this knowledge to put the British forces at uh, disadvantages in the battles. Now, he so he, he relied on his knowledge of uh, local geography, while Daniel Morgan uh, relied on very cunning tactics and deception to win battles. Um, now, remember, the Patriots did not have nearly the numbers nor, or the firepower that the British Army had, so they had to rely on tactics and knowledge of local geography in order to try and gain an advantage. While they didn't have superior fighting force, they did have um, better tactics and a knowledge of the area where the fighting was taking place. The American general, Daniel Morgan, was a charismatic, hard-drinking, hard-fighting frontiersman who had good reason to hate the British. He'd once received 500 lashes while serving as a wagoner with the British Army. Morgan's real problem was that only 400 of his men were regulars. Most of the rest were militia, liable to panic and run away at a crucial moment, as they had so often in the past. So the night before the battle, he went round his camp like Henry V before Agincourt, encouraging his men, explaining his tactics, telling them that they wouldn't be left to the bayonets of the British infantry or the sabres of Tarleton's feared cavalry. At five in the morning, he rallied them again. Boys, get up. Benny is coming. Morgan's tactics that morning were indeed revolutionary. Instead of forming his men up in tightly packed ranks, he drew them up in three widely spaced defensive lines. This wasn't simply defence in depth, designed to physically and psychologically exhaust the British. It maximised the capabilities of his militia, many of them good shots, but reluctant to take the regulars on in close combat. He would effectively ambush the British.
When the impulsive Tarleton saw the first American line, he immediately ordered an attack. Without consulting other commanders in the field, and regardless of the fact that his men had been on the march for most of the night. The first line of widely spread sharpshooters was hidden here in the grass. They had orders to fire once and then fall back. Their first shots picked off 15 dragoons and checked the first cavalry charge. The second line, more experienced militia, was about 150 yards behind. They'd been told to fire just two volleys when the British were in killing range, concentrating on the epaulette men, the officers. Then they too could disperse. As the battle-hardened British bayonet men crashed into the American third line, Morgan's bold plan was in the balance. An order to regroup was misinterpreted as a call to retreat. American regular soldiers and the remaining militias appeared to panic. The battle looked lost. Morgan himself stepped in to steady their nerves and save the day. Form, form, my brave fellows, he shouted. Give them just one more fire and the day is ours. Old Morgan is never beaten. Although the Americans had once found it hard to stop a redcoat regiment in full flood, this time their line held. The exhausted British were effectively surrounded. Tarleton was one of the lucky few to escape. Cowpens had witnessed the most skillful display of American generalship in the Revolutionary War. Combining the strengths of his militia and regular troops, Morgan had found a way of matching the British in open battle. 500 British redcoats were captured, 200 wounded, and more than 100 lay dead on the field. I think that Calpins is one of the most important American victories of the war. Although in a sense it was only a skirmish, the loss of 900 men was enough to tilt the balance of the war in the south because the armies involved were so small. Cornwallis had lost a quarter of his fighting force. Now, another, ma another American, this guy, General Francis Marion, a.k.a. the Swamp Fox, uh, he led a specific group of soldiers that would sleep uh, that would sleep during the day and then travel by night. And they attacked using uh, guerrilla tactics, or they would attack and then retreat uh, very quickly into the swamps of South Carolina. Um, so now... Judging by this picture, do you think that he was a nice guy? Um, uh, yeah, probably not. But let's go back to that term, guerrilla tactics. Um, why do you think these tactics were necessary, and why do you think that they were effective? Um, remember, the British Army, they were still trying to fight a European-style war, um, and they had the superior-style war, um, and they had the superior superior arms, superior uh, forces, but, but the Americans basically had to use whatever they could to try and gain an advantage. Um, so, but why don't you think that the British fought the same way? Hmm. If they're seeing that this is working for the Continental Army, why, don't, why didn't they do the same thing? After the British triumphs at Charleston and Camden, the British strategy of winning the war from the South up seemed invincible. General Cornwallis held the southeastern coast from Savannah to Charleston. 
With no American army left in the South, Cornwallis confidently moved inland to set up a chain of forts. The British, as they move further and further north, getting away from Charleston, getting away from Savannah, they create what are called lines of communications, these long supply lines. Now, you can get food locally, but you can't get ammunition locally. You can't get all those other things that armies need to function. So supply trains have to be organized. Convoys have to be run. Once you do that, you've created a target. The greatest threat to British supply lines came from the bands of guerrilla fighters called partisans. One of their most aggressive leaders was the wealthy planter Thomas Sumter. Sumter raised his own guerrilla army and fought more than a dozen battles against the British and the Loyalists. The fierce partisan was known as the Carolina Gamecock. When British-born lawyer William Davy heard of Charleston's surrender, he immediately left his practice and sold his considerable estate in North Carolina to fund his own guerrilla army. At Charlotte, with only 150 men, Davy fought General Cornwallis and his entire army to a virtual standstill. The tall and elegant Davy was said to have killed more men with his sword than any other American officer in the Revolution. The most unlikely partisan leader was Francis Marion. He was 48 years old when he finally got uh, a chance to really show his stuff. Uh, he wasn't a military man by background, and he had congenital problems with his knees and his ankles. He didn't even look like he was physically capable of being an officer running around in the field. For eight months, the survival of the revolution in South Carolina largely depended on Francis Marion and his phantom army. He led only a small band of men at any one time, some white, some black, and all of them poor with makeshift arms ranging from ancient muskets to short swords made from saws. Always the commander, Marion himself never fought. His sword was even rusted into its scabbard. But his troops bled the British without mercy. Cornwallis became so desperate to stop him that he finally sent Bonaster Tarleton to hunt him down. After tracking Marion through 26 miles of swamp, even the indomitable Tarleton gave up. Come, my boys, let us go back. As for this damned old fox, the devil himself could not catch him. The epithet caught on. Francis Marion became known as the Swamp Fox. In the end, partisan leaders like Marion reinvented American warfare. They came along and they, they took advantage of the, of the geography and the tactics, and they knew that um, controlling territory was not as important as getting at your enemy and getting at him in a way that you could really hurt him. And it became a model for future wars. In 1780, most of the battles in the South were fought between Americans, rebel versus loyalist, brother against brother. Simmering resentments boiled over into full-fledged civil war. The civil war builds up because of the intensity of the passions, and it will start getting away from the soldiers and start getting into the hands of the locals. And this is where you get into Hatfield and McCoy type situations. It becomes personal. They're not fighting about king and country anymore. They're not fighting about ideals about liberty. This is revenge. You shot my brother, I'll shoot your brother. Southern loyalists had years of patriot oppression to avenge. For refusing to renounce the king, they had been fined and jailed. Their property had been confiscated. 
they'd been executed. Newspapers had even printed recipes for the proper method of tarring and feathering loyalists. Now, with the British behind them, the loyalists were eager to settle old scores. Their vengeance was described by the rebel governor of South Carolina, John Rutledge. The enemy have burned a prodigious number of houses and turned a vast many women, with their children, almost naked into the woods. They seem determined to break every man's spirit. By 1780, half of Americans were neither patriot nor loyalist. They were known as trimmers, drifting to whichever side the winds of war might blow them. Into this sea of vacillation plunged one of Cornwallis's most dependable commanders. Major Patrick Bulldog Ferguson was determined to recruit every fence-sitter in the Carolinas. He soon gathered 1,100 men, all of them American. His loyalists, dressed in bright red, learned the bayonet and prepared to fight their neighbors to the death. On October 6th, Ferguson chose to make a stand on a heavily wooded hill in North Carolina called Kings Mountain. There, he defied God Almighty and all the rebels out of hell to overcome him. The next day, those rebels arrived, nearly a thousand hunters and farmers carrying their long rifles. The men were dead shots with their famous frontier weapons, to which they gave names like Hot Lead and Sweet Lead. Smoothly and silently, the rebels moved into position. By the time Ferguson's pickets spotted them, they had the mountains surrounded. A rebel colonel yelled, Here they are, boys! Shout like hell and fight like devils! The riflemen took cover and filled the air with their bullets. At last, an hour into the battle, even Ferguson saw he was finished. He signaled a few of his officers to follow him in an escape. But a local boy had alerted the rebels that Ferguson, the only British soldier on the field, was wearing a plaid shirt to hide his uniform. It appeared that almost 50 rifles must have been leveled at him. Seven rifle balls passed through his body. Both of his arms were broken, and his hat and clothing were literally shot to pieces. Private James P. Collins. Ferguson's second-in-command called for quarter. The chilling reply was Tarleton's quarter, shouted by rebels who remembered the massacre of their kinsmen under a white flag. Some of the other backwoodsmen didn't know a white flag meant surrender and kept on shooting. At the end of the day, 700 loyalists were taken prisoner. More than 150 lay dead. An equal number were so badly wounded they were left where they fell. As the news of Kings Mountain spread, Southern Tories began to lay down their guns. 1780, a year that began with despair for the rebels, had ended with a glimmer of hope. The British stranglehold on the south was weakening. Despite inflation, treason, and Charleston, the Patriots' worst defeat of the war, the revolution was still alive. Before the next year would end, the fate of America would be decided in a showdown near a quiet Virginia settlement called Yorktown. Well, that brings us to this guy, 
General Charles Cornwallis. This was the British commander in the South, um, and he, he based his battle uh, plans around capturing the Carolinas, North and South Carolina. Um, but we saw that after, like, there were victories there, the Battle of uh, Calpin's, Battle of Gil uh, Guilford Courthouse, um, and there are other victories in the Carolinas which forced him to shift his forces north up into Virginia, to try, and he did so to try and cut off uh, supply routes, kind of like what they did, what they tried to do in New York with capturing Albany, that would uh, cut off the supply routes from New England. Well, he hoped that capturing Virginia and capturing major outposts in Virginia would help cut off supplies coming down from New England into the southern armies, but. But even before Car Cornwallis was able to arrive, uh, the British had won victories in Virginia under one of their newest generals, General Benedict Arnold. Uh, yes, uh, you heard me correctly. The former American general, American hero, uh, had turned traitor and become a general for the British forces. Um, and why do you think he did this? Well, he got jealous, honestly. He felt that he didn't receive the recognition, um, and or enough recognition or enough payment for his victories. So he decided, look, if you're not going to pay me enough, I'll go to somebody that will. So he secretly agreed to turn over West Point, New York, to the British. And this picture is of Benedict Arnold and John Andre conspiring against the Continental Army. You can see that they're uh, trying to be secretive. If you look in the background. Uh, you can see uh, the Continental Army sitting, um, and they're conspiring close by. Um, so their plan was to turn over West Point, New York, to the British, but their plan was discovered. Um, but before it could be captured, Arnold escaped and joined uh, joined the British Army and joined the British ranks. And even though this treason outraged Many, many colonists. I mean, it's, this is one of their heroes that just decided, look, I'm not going to fight for you guys anymore. I'm turning tail and I'm going to fight for the other guys. This enraged many, many people in, uh, in America. But Arnold was never captured and ended up living out the rest of his life in Great Britain. And this, my friends, is the origin of the term, uh, that guy's a Benedict Arnold, when you used to speak about someone who betrayed you. That guy's a Benedict Arnold, or that person turned Benedict Arnold. Um, so that is the origin. Benedict Arnold, American hero, turned British general. Now, I mentioned that he was able to gain some victories in Virginia. Well, he was able to capture and burn Richmond, the capital of Virginia, as well as other towns in Virginia. Um, so when the British commander, Cornwallis, arrived, he hoped to have the same type of success. And at first he was able to capture Charlottesville, Virginia, but um, after some fighting with uh, a General Lafayette, the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, uh, General Lafayette, the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, he retreated to the Yorktown Peninsula. And he retreated to Yorktown because he believed that he would be able to restocked with much needed supplies from the sea. But what he thought was a very uh, tactical maneuver would turn out to be his downfall. And as you can see, this is the, the map of uh, map of the Yorktown Peninsula. Um, and you can see the York River and this Yorktown area. This is where the British forces were holed up under Cornwallis. So by 1781, the British army occupied the Yorktown Peninsula. And so Washington saw this not as a tactical advantage for Cornwallis, but he saw it as an opportunity to try and trap him. So he marches, marched his army south from New York. Um, and the French Navy, who at this point was, France was now officially our allies, they arrive and closed off the opportunity of escape by sea. So Cornwallis saw this like, all right, well, they don't have a navy, so we'll just back ourselves up to the sea, we'll be fine. But with the arrival of the French Navy, their escape by sea was um, 
Escape by Sea was cut off. Um, so you got the French Navy bombarding the city from the sea. Part of the French army had landed and was bombarding from one side, and the American army bombarding from another side. So after weeks of being placed under siege, uh, the British finally surrendered. So, which mean, which marks Yorktown as the last official battle of the American Revolution. One night in November of 1781, Franklin and his friend Elkanah Watson stay up late talking about the war. They have news from America that the French army and navy are finally on the move, attempting a highly difficult military campaign. Because it takes over a month for news to cross the Atlantic, they have no idea how the plan has turned out. We talked that night only about the great combined military operation to take Cornwallis in Virginia. All evening long we pored over the maps and weighed all the possibilities. Franklin was suspended between hope and fear. One moment he would be in gloomy despondency and then Looking at the situation in another way, he would flash into a conviction of complete success. And when this 75-year-old man became exhilarated, his whole body assumed a state of elasticity, of active play. I didn't share his optimism. Went home around 11 o'clock, saddened over the fate of my country. One hour later, at midnight, a messenger arrives at Passy with startling news. The French and American armies and the French Navy have surrounded and taken the entire British army at Yorktown. Washington could never have won at Yorktown. He didn't know how to lay down a, a siege. He, he was a, a militia colonel. Uh, he, he learned a lot during his eight years of fighting, but the French army and the French participation and the French naval isolation of Cornwallis was absolutely crucial. It is an American victory. It is a French victory. And it is a victory for Benjamin Franklin's diplomacy. Mon cher papa, do you know why your neighbor has not written to you in a while? Because I am sulking. Yes, monsieur papa, I am sulking because of you. Here you take entire armies in America, and we, your poor neighbors, have to read about it in the newspapers. We were getting drunk drinking to your health, to that of Washington, to Independence, to the King, to Lafayette, and not one word from you. So I'm left only to imagine that you must be overjoyed. You must suddenly have become 20 years younger upon hearing the news, and you will lead us to lasting peace after this glorious victory. I will continue to sulk until I hear from you. To Madame Brion, my dear friend, it was a great victory, but I am not celebrating yet. War is a very uncertain thing. I play this game exactly like you've seen me play chess. I do not assume victory until the last move is made. Now, the British defeat at Yorktown forced them to agree to peace talks. Um, and so the last official battle was Yorktown, but the war itself was officially over with the Treaty of Paris, which was ratified by Congress in April of 1783. And in the Treaty of Paris, uh, Great Britain recognized the United States as an independent nation. This is no longer um, colonies that are rebelling. This is now an official independent nation. And the treaty also established the borders of the United States. Uh, to the east and west, the border extended from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. In the north, it stopped at the Great Lakes. And in the south, the border stopped at Florida. So the Treaty of Paris officially established the United States as an independent nation and established the borders of that nation. So we now have our east and west, north and south borders. Um, and in the treaty, the United States also agreed to pay loyalists for property that they had lost during the war. Um, so that was part of the agreement, but 
in actuality, in uh, most of the states never actually made those payments. Um, so it's over. The U.S. won the war. Um, how? I mean, they were outmanned, outgunned, but they still ended up winning. So I wanted to end this part of uh, the lesson by looking at uh, this, this, this chart because it shows some of the um, factors that influenced why this group was able to defeat one of the most powerful nations at that time. The first uh, thing that worked in their favor was geography. Um, the British were far from home and they were fighting in unfamiliar territory, but the Americans knew the landscape and the best best routes to get to and from the battles, and honestly, the best places to fight. We talked about Nathaniel Green and Daniel uh, Mortimer, like, using their knowledge of local geography to keep putting the British forces at a disadvantage. So, the Americans knew the terrain, the British were far fighting up to, like, 3,000 miles from home, so geography was on the side of the colonists. Foreign help. Uh, France provided money, supplies, and military support. support. And we talked about uh, General Bernardo de Galvez, uh, who fought in the South and in the West. Uh, Spanish forces attacked the Br British, especially along the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and lastly, uh, patriotism. Uh, the Americans, were, at, as they were seeing um, uh, victories in battle, they were growing proud of their country and achievements. And... Especially, we mentioned British cruelty in the South, uh, the cruelty by the uh, British forces and the Loyalists. Uh, this cruelty turned many Loyalists into patriots. So, that's it. Geography, foreign help, patriotism. Three main factors that contributed to uh, the American forces winning the War for Independence. Which brings us to our assignment. So we all know that uh, the Continental Army won the Revolutionary War, but I want you to think for a second, what if it didn't? What if things had gone differently and the British ended up winning the war? Uh, do you think that patriots would have continued to protest because it was these, uh, it was the taxes and all the, the taxation without representation? Um, that caused patriots to uh, rebel in the first place. Do you think they would continue to protest, or would things have quieted down? Um, do you think that eventually things would have led to another revolutionary war? Um, and remember a, a few lessons back, we talked about the men that were involved with drafting the Declaration of Independence. Well, what do you think would have happened to them? So I want you to keep these things in mind as we go through the assignment, because our assignment for today is to imagine that instead of surrendering at Yorktown, the British ended up winning the Revolutionary War. And so it's the British won the war, and now it is one year after the war, and you have returned home to Pennsylvania from fighting or from being alongside your family. Um, this is a year after the war. What are some of the things that the British, British have done in response to the war? Um, have they punished every, everyone involved, or were they lenient? What did they do to, like, George Washington, Ben Franklin, um, Thomas Jefferson? Uh, what happened to what happened to these men? Were, were they punished, or were they lenient? Um, did they impose new taxes, or did they decide that since taxes had helped start the original conflict, that they would try and raise money in other ways. Uh, did they give colonial representation in Parliament? Um, and finally, do you think that colonists will rise up again or tr and try to fight for freedom, or do you think that they would be content to remain British subjects? So, with all these things in mind, I want you to write a journal entry describing life in Pennsylvania one year after the war. Um, and I want you to, in your response, tell me how things have changed. Um, are things finally back to some level of normal? Um, 
Are British troops still occupying your town, or have you been allowed to set up a local government? And I want this to be written in a minimum of three paragraphs. The first paragraph, you are to describe what happened to the leaders. We mentioned Washington, Jefferson, Adams, uh, John Hancock, etc. What happened to the leaders? Were the British lenient, or did they punish them? In the second paragraph, I want you to decide, describe what has happened to you personally at the end of the war. Um, imagine that you had you had been fighting, or you had been uh, you had tr you had remained neutral throughout the war. Well, what what ha what has happened to you? And in the third and final paragraph, um, this is your chance to to think about and predict the future. Um, do you think the colonists are going to rise up again, or do you think that after the war enough things have changed that they'll remain part of Great Britain and they will, uh, they'll be British su subjects, or if they do rise up, who's going to be who's going to be the leaders? Um, so this assignment is worth. 20 points, so I want you to be very thorough, and you will only receive full credit if you answer three, all three, if you answer in all three paragraphs and you're thorough. Remember, there is no penalty for writing too much, but there is a penalty for not writing enough and not using enough, being enough, uh, being descriptive enough. Um, and so that is our assignment for today. Now, if you have any questions, please let me know. I, I definitely want, I want to help you out. This can be a little confusing, but I think this can be a fun, um, a fun way to you, like, for you to be like, hmm, I wonder what would have happened. So it's a chance for you to use your imagination and your creativity. So, like always, if you have any questions, please send me a Moodle message, and I'll do my best to explain. All right, have a wonderful rest of your day.